Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. began his entrepreneurial journey at 15 years old when he set up an independent tutoring business for families at his high school in Los Angeles, California. Please welcome the CEO and founder of the Men's Skin Care Product Creek, Jake Rosenberg. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Jake Rosenberg, who actually started something that I probably need, Crete. Cause, uh, but before we get into Crete, let's go ahead and introduce the world to Jake. Jake, how are we doing? Pretty great. Thanks for having me on. So, Jake, give us a little background. Where are you calling in from? Tell us, a, and then we'll get a little bit about the business. Yeah, so I live in uh, Southern California. I'm originally from New York, Long Island. Moved here. Went to high school in L.A. Been here ever since. So, uh, yeah, I love it out here. It's not always the easiest to do business in California, but it turns out that my business is actually, it's the epicenter in the U.S. is Southern California. I did not know that when I was starting this. It's just kind of a happy coincidence. So, yeah, I had a, a ski accident a couple of years ago and it, it left a scar on my nose. And from that, I was forced to learn about skincare. And as a regular guy who's, you know, bar soap to wash his face and didn't really know much, you know, I occasionally use Vaseline or moisturizer or something yeah. like that. Um learning about actual products like hyaluronic acid serum concealer that guys just didn't even know they existed. It wasn't even a problem of, are they too feminine or masculine or whatever it was guys didn't know about them. So I started Crete to educate guys on products that work amazingly well for them and tell them a message that these products take 30 seconds or less to use and they can change your skin. And if your skin looks better and you look better and you feel better, it's, you know, it's not just a skin health thing. It's a mental health and wellness thing. We all want to be more confident. So it worked for me, and so now we got a lot of guys using our products, and it's going pretty well. Nice. So, so for the listeners at home, what is Crete, and how did how did you kind of get to that process of uh, mass producing it? Yeah. So, Crete is a skincare company for guys. I mean, we do actually sell a lot to women. the The sentiment of the company is that we kind of removed all of what what they call the beauty industry, which I don't even like that it's called the beauty industry. That's inherently not for guys, right? Yeah, makes sense. So every package was you know, frilly pink packaging, overpriced things. It was focusing on phrases and words like, be- you know, beautification, contour, brighten. You know, do you want your concealer sheer or do you want it like, you know, high glossy? It's like, I don't know what any of this means. Yeah. I want something that can hide a nose scar. I want something that can hide dark circles. I want a moisturizer that's not too oily or shiny, etc. So that's kind of why we started Creed. It's because I actually learned chemistry. I formulated the products myself because I just, there was the industry was stuck in the 1980s, whether it was from manufacturing to the outlook that they had on actually, you know, treating customers as real people and understanding the customer experience was just go to CVS and buy our thing. It's like, no, there's a there's a much better way to do that. There's a way to find your tone at home. So you don't have to be embarrassed. There's a way to tell you about complex chemistry without it actually being complicated. So I started it, you know, from the ground up, Like I said, I I learned chemistry and I formulated our first two products, you know, Google and YouTube and a little bit of time, um, you can learn anything. It's one of the first things I get asked about is like, how did you teach yourself? And it, uh, you know, time is a resource. Now that we're bigger, my time is more valuable. But when I was first starting out, I had time. I didn't necessarily have funding, but I had time. So you can use that time and free resources. I Googled, how do you formulate? Watched 50 videos on it. Started learning things, you know, anionic versus cationic interactions. Oh, that's why this is foaming, et cetera, et cetera. And you build up your knowledge base. After a month or two, I was making really great formulas. So, you know, from there, you sell a little bit, then you invest a little of your own money, it grows. And so you kind of want to do it step by step, making sure that at no point you're wasting time or wasting money. And then once it kind of grows to a certain point, you might bring on investors, you might expand your product line, you might expand your marketing channels. And it's kind of like day by day, you just grind and you really 
build it up into something bigger. Then you look back at six months later and you're like, oh, we're on five sales channels and we have four products and we're selling a bunch of, you know, we've quadrupled our revenue, you know, things like that. So the aha moments only come back when you turn around and you're like, oh, look at where we came from. But every day it feels like only little steps. So yeah, there's no, the only celebrations we have, I guess, are like numerical milestones. Blank sold in a day, blank sold this year. But to get there requires so many other little wins that people usually like to skip over that. It's like, you know, it took me 10 years to become an overnight success. It's like I've put so much time and effort and built such a good team that's done the same. There were no easy wins, but, you know, there were wins because you make them. So yeah. that's kind of that's kind of the philosophy I have. A lot of people like to glorify this as, you know. They like to look at the startup once it's very successful and, and forget the 3 a.m., 4 a.m. nights, six months in a row, no weekends, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're trying to highlight on this podcast, right? You mentioned um, the education going through YouTube uh, University, right, and Google University. Basically. And and that's, that's what I've been trying to tell folks. You know, I paid quite a bit of money to go to Syracuse University to get my master's. Not everybody needs to do that. There is ample amount of free education available in books, on YouTube, on the internet. Now, what was that moment for you when you were kind of going through this process that you said, you know what, I think I have a product that I can actually scale? Well, once we had the product that worked really well, where I put it on and I was like, okay, this, my dry skin is just gone. There's no irritation anymore. I can dry shave like a crazy person if I want and put it on and there's no irritation. It's like, once I, once I realized we had a product that good, I said, okay, let me look at the numbers. Margins are crazy. Let me look at the fulfillment. It's pretty small, $3 and something cents to ship to New York. It's like, okay, well, all the business things make sense. We can put more money into it. You know, as long as our marketing, our marketing costs, you know, that's, that's the vast majority of what it costs to do business. If we are acquire a customer for 30 bucks versus 50 bucks, that's a $20 difference, obviously. But like the, the products, if we got them for free, it would only save us a couple of dollars. So, you know, they're, they're relatively inexpensive. The cost is in the acquiring of the customer. And so that was when we, you know, first we knew we had a business because we had a product that people were buying and not returning and they were repeat customers every month. Then we realized we had a real business once we started hitting marketing efficiency where we'd spend a dollar and make more than a dollar. That's when we started scaling it. You know, you, we spent plenty of money where I'd spend a dollar, make 50 cents. Next week, spend a dollar, make 55, spend a dollar, make 60. But we did that with a thousand bucks a week, you know. Now we're doing 10 times that way more than that. And, and so, but we hit that efficiency and grew. Yeah. So, so that was it. It was basically, you have to have a product that makes people want to come back to it without you needing to do anything. You know, because what I, then, yeah, that's, that's it. You know, one of the things you mentioned uh, is the cost of per customer, right? Yeah. You, you, you said you were at $50, now you're at $30. Can you give the the listeners at home that might not be familiar with that phrase, one, what does it mean? And then how do you kind of measure it? Yeah, so customer acquisition costs, right? If I want to tell someone about Crete, how do I do it? I have to run an ad somewhere. So let's say I'm running an ad on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, something like that. You'll have what's called a CPM, which is a cost per mil. So an impression is like, I think, I don't remember the exact definition, but it's something like, on a million people scrolling on Instagram, it'll put the ad in front of them. Now, most people will scroll by as you do. So let's say the cost per mail is 50 bucks. I don't remember what ours is, to be honest. I have a whole team that handles it. They give me the weekly report. I'm on to future products and raising money and other stuff. So um, if our CPM is 50 bucks, that means we spend $50. So if that gets to a thousand people, great, a thousand people saw it. How many people watch the ad? Let's say it's a hundred. Okay, how many people of that 100 click on the ad? That's a CTR, click-through rate. So let's say that's 10. So you went from a fifth, now for 50 bucks, we got 10 people to click into the website. I think the rates I'm giving are not that great. I don't think you'd be doing so well if only 10 people clicked in. But um, let me think. I think a click-through rate of 2 or 3% is pretty decent. So at 1,000 people, you'd want like 20 or 30. So let's say you got 20 people. 
they click in. Now they're in your website. And again, this is the funnel, right? You right. lose people at each level of the marketing funnel. And so then you have 20 people on your website. How many of them navigate to your product detail page, the one where you actually buy it? Maybe that's only 50%. Can you do anything at any of these levels? Can you make an ad that captures people's attention more, stops them from scrolling, as we say? Okay, well, if you can do that, maybe you get 200 people watching the ads instead of 100. Now, all of a sudden, you get 40 people on your website later in the funnel instead of 20. So that's that's where you have to really pay attention to every level of this. So then they click out, and then they add to cart, and people abandon the carts. Do you have emails? They tell them, hey, you abandoned this. Come back. Here's an extra deal. They check out. Do you fulfill it quickly? So it's one of those things where you have to break it down into every single layer of that. And there's different marketing strategies, different teams, different designs, but they all need to be kind of considered as one general customer experience. For instance, uh, when somebody adds to our cart, they basically check out way higher than the industry standard. I'm not exactly sure why we designed a nice cart. It's nothing revolutionary. <laughs> it just probably has something to do with our product page they really like it so when they actually make the decision to add to cart they're intending to actually buy it they don't leave and so there's all these considerations up and down up and down the funnel so again if i was to spend that 50 dollars and get it to a thousand people and it ultimately converted into two sales let's say well if my products are 50 bucks each then i'm getting a hundred dollars let's say the cost of goods is ten dollars each and to fill it is another five that's 15 and 15 it costs me 30. so i spent 50 bucks the products themselves and the fulfillment cost me 30 and i made 100. i made 20 bucks is the difference i'm profitable so that's it it's pretty simple math it's just you know in that case if i could get our click-through rate to double we would have made 200 dollars. Yep. still would have you know it would cost us like 100, 110, so we'd make $90. So that's it. It's, it's essentially a reasonably simple formula. It's just people kind of skip over every interaction as a chance for you to lose customers. So maybe don't have navigation on your website. Take 10 steps because then you'll lose people at every step. Yeah. Maybe take people, you know, maybe at a landing page where they can buy right on there, like, one one click purchasing. There's a lot of that's why those kinds of things come into play. It's because where are you weak in your marketing funnel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. makes sense. It makes sense. And I'm, I'm I'm be completely honest. I'm actually checking out your website, and it just has a. We'll talk about the the marketing and, and branding for a minute, but it just certainly has that masculinity feel with the color, yeah. the shopping cart. I really do. I really do like it. But one of the things you were mentioning uh, before we get into the branding and marketing was venture capital. You mentioned you're out, you have a team, right, doing what they need to do while you're out currently raising funds. Tell us about your experience uh, raising, or are you currently raising capital for the business? And tell me about it. just you. did. Um, so I, I stayed away from VCs and institutional investors yeah. like the plague. Um, <laughs> I, I self-funded this for three and a half years. We were doing incredibly well. There's no reason for me to have some entity come in with their own set of rules. Yeah, Maybe they yeah. could get 10% of the company and they basically act like they own 50%. They get seats on the board. They, they veto stuff. They'd want us to do certain things in the interest of revenue instead of profitability and efficiency. Right. It's just a different business model. Their interests would not be aligned with mine and my teams. So we raised from angels, which was great. I've had a pretty solid angel network for a while. And That'll allow us to do what we're doing. You know, we grew like 8X this year so far. Wow. So if we can do that again next year, it's like, great. Then we'll go to institutions because then I'll have leverage. I'll say, hey, we're doing X millions a year. If you want it, like we do it correctly. We have a track record. Right. But as far as institutional investors, um, they can make sense. Accelerators can make sense. They just didn't. We had enough success without having outside funding that we didn't need to kind of give up the company essentially. And, you know, they have a lot of power of you. Something nobody talks about is if a VC or an, an accelerator or some sort of institutional money comes in, they have a lot of power over you, even if they didn't take over your voting rights, even if that, because if, if you're raising another round in the future, let's say you're doing well, if they don't come back in that round, it signals to all other institutions that you're not worthy of investment. So they have quite a bit of leverage yeah. if they decide to not invest or they might want better terms in order to invest a signal to other people that. So I just, I was not about to give 
somebody who doesn't necessarily care about our company and our people and our products and our attention to detail and quality and all those things, all our principles, uh, massive leverage over us when we don't need that. We're doing great. So that's it. You know, there's no, no such thing as a free lunch. If you're going to get a half million to $10 million check from somebody, they're going to expect something from you. So make sure you have very clear expectations and understanding of what they're asking, what they're going to demand. And yep. it's not always, it's, it's honestly, it's usually disproportionate. They usually want more than they're putting in. They're not <laughs> trying to be charitable to you. They're a business. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think you brought up several great points. One for aspiring entrepreneurs to take a look about what your business and your, your priorities and your goals and, and what you mentioned, what your business stands for, because venture capitalists, you know, they do, there's some great ones out there. Don't get me wrong, but the, at the Absolutely. end of the day, their, their goal is to make money. Yeah. Look, they, they were the first people and, you know, Peter Thiel, and I don't know the, the exact VC firm. They were the ones that were first into Facebook and they helped Facebook grow into the behemoth yep. that has become more, like, you know, everybody used Facebook until everybody used Instagram until everyone used TikTok. Like, but for a while they were Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, you know, and Oculus and like all these, and everyone was using all of their products. Same with Google. Like there's no, there's not inherently evil. It's they're giving you money. They just, they will, ex they're not going to give you a multi-million dollar check and not expect a lot in return, yep. which is completely reasonable. They're giving you a ton of money. So I always tell entrepreneurs who I consult with, especially if they're seed stage, it's always easier to spend less than it is to make more. If you can learn how to negotiate a contract, if you can learn how to build your product, if you can fulfill it yourself for the first six months, year, year and a half, whatever it is, you have to do it because it's a lot easier to do that than it is to raise money or make the money. You know, it's the very rare exception where you have like, you know, Apple computer where they're just money hand over fist year one. Right. You know, things are usually a little more of a grind. And so if they're a grind, spend less because guess what? If you have some money in the bank, get as far as you can with it because then it's easier to raise money. Or, you know, we got to the point where we make enough profitable revenue where I was raising money so we could grow faster. It wasn't so that we could operate, it was so that we could double or triple our size quickly. So it's a completely different, I was playing a different game, a better game for us yeah. with that. Yeah. Now, is this your first business? Uh, no, it's like my fourth and a half because I don't, I tutored a lot in high school and college, but I don't know if I consider that a business. I was just mostly making a lot of cash. <laughs> hey, that's a, that's being a side well, hustle right there. Yeah. I mean, it was, I was, I had like an internship at Universal Music Group and then I'd finish that at 6 p.m. And then I would go tutor from like 6.30 to 11.30 p.m. for kids wow. in summer school and doing SATs and that stuff. So I was exhausted. I'd come back the next day at the internship. It was an unpaid internship. And I was making more than like the people I was working for because I was making like a few hundred bucks every night tutoring. But yeah, that was one summer I was exhausted. Bought some <laughs> Apple stock and Amazon with that stuff. But um, so I don't know if I consider that, but I had a shoe company that I sold, uh, a fund, and then a uh, software company that did a lot of e commerce tools. Nice. So. so yeah, it's been a bunch of things. Would you consider yourself a serial entrepreneur? Yeah, but also I don't know if the implications of that are, you know, there's positive ones because maybe it means you have experience. But there's negative ones because I know a lot of serial entrepreneurs who basically can't actually execute and can't finish a project. So they're bouncing from project to project. So they always look busy and like they always have a cool pitch deck, but nothing ever gets built. So I actually build the stuff and make them run successfully. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. The stages of my experience, like it started with the software, then into the shoes and manufacturing. And then, so this is a combination of software helped me with the sales funnel and the website and those kinds of things. And the shoes helped me with fulfillment and manufacturing and FDA regulations, et cetera. So you learn more from each business. And then at the end of the day, business, if you, you understand fundamentals of unit economics, marketing costs, strategies, they're 80% the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Skincare yeah. industry and the shoe industry, like they were not dissimilar in the way you needed to run the businesses. Obviously the marketing was going to be different and things like that, but you know. Makes sense. Really, yeah. You know, one of the things you mentioned quite a bit is education. You were doing some tutoring. What is like one thing you would say like was the most beneficial for you? from an education perspective? 
Um, I knew how to encourage myself to learn about things that were really shitty to learn about. <laughs> Not the parents, I don't know, but I'm gonna. I don't know. No, you. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, and that's how I tutored. I used to, I did not like English class in school. I read zero books. And I was a salutatorian in my high school class, so that's the second highest GPA. So it's not like I was a bad student. I was like the, one of the top two students. I read zero books in English. Why? Because the books they picked were boring. I didn't like it. I didn't like the way they were. But I got an A in those classes because I figured out how to kind of gamify and beat the system i turned like the english class itself and getting an a into a challenge to overcome and so you know whether it was this english teacher doesn't believe in me so i'm going to show him whatever it was i have motivated kids in the funniest ways possible one of the main ones was like a lot of boys would not like their english teachers because they like the english teachers would just like give them books they hated and so i was like how nice would it be to stick it in his face that like you get an a on a paper and like that, like, yeah, I'll show him, was a motivator to get kids to do well in English class. Like, who cares what gets them to read the book and whatever? So you have to figure out a way to get yourself motivated because, you know, half my job is operations. It's I'm negotiating a contract with a new filler, right? That's not fun. Yeah. I am. I'm trying to figure out how to more out, like, you know, automate our customer service. That's certainly not fun. There's a lot of things you have to do, but you have to motivate yourself to realize like the result is so great if you pull it off that, you know, you just have to get through it. So that would be the kind of thing from the educational perspective. I taught that to students and I, I use it for myself. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of contract, I think the worst acronym anybody can hear is RFP. Just I'm going to issue another RFP, which is which essentially it's just request for a proposal. Right. So if you're dealing with contracts, right. When you do an RFP, you might be looking at a CRM or some type of software and you're going to go talk to a bunch of different companies and they're going to negotiate different prices. And it's, it is tedious. It's long and tedious. Yeah. Now, but just, it has to be done. It's one yep. of those things that has to be done. It's yeah. true. Yeah. It has to be done. It's, it's just things like, and I think that's, what's important too is, is folks that are listening, there's certain aspects of the entrepreneurship world that you're just going to have to do that nobody's going to do it for you. Uh, Jay kind of explicitly said, you know, the staying up until three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, doing fulfillments yourself. I was doing that two months, two, two, three days ago. Cause we just launched this second product yesterday. We just launched our second product, like literally Monday. So yesterday. And you know, we had emails, we had new ads that came out. We had website, we were building different pages. I was, I was editing images, you know, like we have a nice image of it and I need to put the floating text and the designer was busy, like designing a new page for my developer. So no one could do it. So between like about 1 a.m. and 2.30 a.m., I was just like, I was updating the product images myself. Like someone had to do it. Yep. Everyone was busy. So I, I did it. I had to learn, you know, I've known for a couple of years, but I had to learn Sketch, which is like a Apple's Photoshop. It's like kind of a lighter version of that. Because this always happens. I always need to like, I have an idea. And so I can design a crappy version of it and show my designer. Then she can go build it. So there's a lot of things that you need to acquire skills at. And you need to just be the one that sits down and do it a lot of the time. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What has been the hardest, you know, you mentioned you've been an entrepreneur. You've done it a few times over now. What has been difficult about being an entrepreneur? Well, when you first start something, you have no idea if it's actually going to be successful. You are a crazy person who's like, I'm going to do this even though nobody else has done it. Here's the thing. Everything that we see around us is that yeah. every single product, you know, the person who built the building I'm in said, I'm going to build that building and I'm going to get all the rooms. Like every single thing around you is that. So it's obviously doable. Um, it's just you have to you have to be constantly willing to learn because there are a hundred things you need to know to run a business successfully. And most of them are not rocket science. You just need to know they exist and handle them. Yeah. You know, for me, inventory management, that was easy. Okay. We, it takes us three weeks to produce 10,000 bottles. Okay. We were at where we sell 10,000 bottles in six months, you know, whatever it is, every little thing like that, you just have to be aware of those things. You know, legality and regulations is probably the one that people need to focus a little more on, especially when it comes to starting a corporation with partners or investors uh, learn what you're doing, learn what you're signing, learn the corporate structure you're building, even if it's just a simple LLC, S Corp, C Corp, because those are the things that cause 
giant riffs, yeah. have clear conversations with co-founders about expectations and equity and put it down on paper with clear understanding. There can't be vague vagueness and ambiguity. And so one of the reasons I'm a solo founder with Creed is because I had partners with other things and it worked great until it didn't. Right. Worked great until, well, frankly, I did all the work and they stopped doing the work. And then I got bitter and they like, well, I still own 50%, so there's nothing you can do. It's like, okay, well, I can move on to a new business. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's what you got to do. What what would you say has been easy? Has there been anything easy about this new venture with your experience as an entrepreneur? Um, It's easier to handle the ups and downs. It's not easy. It's easier. You know, we'll have revenue days that are insane and we'll celebrate, you know, we'll metaphorically pop champagne because I don't do that unless there's like wins over time. And then the next day it's like for no reason sales are down. You're like, what? And then they're back up and it's a roller coaster. And so I can handle that pretty well. It's been 10 years of me doing this kind of stuff. So that's Oof, I call it like entrepreneur days where it's like four things went really well and two things went really badly. It's like, how do I, <laughs> do I celebrate those things? But I also don't really have to worry about the bad things because these other things, you know, you got an investor, but like Shopify broke. It's like, okay. <laughs> uh, it's just another day. It's just, that's called Tuesday. So I would say that gets easier. As far as any individual things, you just start knowing more as you get into it. You know, I can look at a website in two seconds and tell you 15 things to improve about it, you know, because I've just done a lot of website design. So things like that, the skills you have that you've practiced get easier. You know, hiring people gets a little easier. I can smell BS yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Now, what what keeps you up at night is with this business that you're starting? What are things that you think about other than, you know, having to edit a picture at 1 and 2 a.m.? Yeah. <sighs> You know, I'm working 24 seven these days because we have an opportunity. We're growing, things are going well. And to me, it's like a window of opportunity. If I don't work my ass off and get my team to, we're going to lose this opportunity. You know, like I said, we grew like eight plus X this year, like 800%. That's crazy. If we can do that next year. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to be dead tired by this time next year. Probably have bags under my eyes. But if we did that again, it could be life changing money. You know, it, it's like I can't, I can't not. So it's funny because when things are going okay, you can relax about them. If things are going really well, you got to really work hard to make them go well and then not ca- capitalize on that. And if things are going really terribly, you have to work really hard to fix them. So the only time you can kind of chill is when things are going okay. So, you know, if things are going well or badly, you know, you need to do something. Um, either do some 180 degrees what you're doing or do exactly what you're doing. So yeah, things are going well. So it's just a lot of work, man. I mean, I don't hate it. I still own the company. I get the benefit of it. And so on those nights where it's like, Oh my God, I'm so tired. Just push through. It's like, yeah, I'm winning from this. So why wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things I was mentioning was like marketing, right? So let's talk about who is your, you know, target audience and what are they receiving when they purchase your item? So we, I looked at basically this stuff and said, I think I'm not like an average dude, but I'm relatively an average guy. He's like a bar of soap before I knew about facial cleansers that had blah, blah, blah ingredients. And, you know, I used Vaseline or moisturizer, whatever I got at CVS, it like smelled nice. Like, oh, it's lavender. I like it. Um, Until I understood about hyaluronic acid serums, like the ones we sell. So... I decided to market this brand to a guy like me or versions of it. So our ads use, I call it aspirational, but approachable models. You know, we use real people, real customers who are like maybe on the 73 year old who looks 50 or a 40 year old who looks 30, but they look like you could look like them. You know, it's, they're not GQ models. Cause I didn't think that was real. I, like, right. I want people to say, Oh, I want to look like that. Another part of our marketing is um, there's kind of a value equation when you're offering a deal and it's like aspirational outcome. Okay, you're going to look younger, dry skin, no irritation, whatever. And then how hard is it? How much time, whatever is it to get there? And then also multiply that by the likelihood of achieving those results. So our promise is you're going to look amazing. You're going to look younger. You're not going to have any more skin issues. 
our tagline is 30 second skincare, which means it's going to take you 30 seconds a day to get there. That's easy. And then the likelihood of it happening is before and after is five star reviews, those kinds of things. So when you put those together, someone comes to our site to go, oh, I want that result. It's going to that's that's all it takes. OK. And I actually believe it'll happen. Sure. Then on top of that, we offer a six dollar trial instead of thirty nine dollars. So because we know you're going to love it. So it's like all of that. And then I only pay six bucks with free shipping. And that's a deal that people just like they can't say no to. And that's there's a book called Hundred Million Dollar Offers. And and we kind of made this. And then I read the book and I was like, oh, what we did fits right in their framework. So that's kind of the marketing. And then as far as the ads, we do video ads. They just need to kind of tell that story. It's not really rocket science. It's 95% user generated content. Guy saying, look, man, this is how fast it is to apply. And he applies it. There's the 30 second part. Because look, I'm at 73, but my skin is looks young. There's the aspirational image part. Here's 500 five star reviews. There's the proof. It's like you just kind of work on that, and you have a video. And I could talk about the nuances of editing those videos for hours because we do them in house. But yeah, one thing I will say is your first two three seconds better grab some attention because people just scroll right by it. Very true. Very yeah. true. In fact, you know. What, you know, you mentioned that you, you mentored and you've done two agreeing. What advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, if you want to do this, understand there is no security blanket. It's on you, which is both unbelievably amazing, but also every single day I need to wake up and figure out what are we even supposed to be doing and then how do we do it? I could say, great, we're going to launch TikTok next week. Maybe that's a terrible idea. Maybe we should be launching on Snapchat. Maybe we should be doing Amazon. Maybe we should just focus on Instagram and Facebook. Maybe I should be trying to get into wholesale and retailers or subscription boxes. There are so many things you can do. And great, you have autonomy to do them all. But you also have to pick which ones to do and actually go and execute them. So that's what I would say is, is, um, is you have to really stay focused. That's it. It's focus and discipline. You have to build things in a way that they can then stand on their own. And I'm talking about like systems or a team or a product. You know, a system might be your customer service system. A couple automated emails, a voicemail that puts them into the email, you know, something, build it. So then you can say, set it down. It's working. Move to the next thing. Because everything you'll build is brick by brick. But yeah, um, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. You need a lot of grit, determination, and focus. There's ups and downs, even with this business. It's going well now, but it took two years to even get the products out and to have some idea that we could even sell a bottle of all with that kind of like delusional, yeah, we'll be a billion dollar company one day. Well, before you sold one bottle. Right. Like, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, but yeah, you know, turns out some delusions are completely true. I mean, we're selling a lot now. We're a lot closer to that than, than we are to when we first started. So it's, it's do that. And then also, you know, just make sure you can support yourself and your family. It's, it will take more money. It will take more time than you think it will potentially. So just make sure you're not like quitting a good job with security without a lot of savings and then jumping into something that could like set you back a few years. Cause I know people that that's happened to, that's the reality of it. You know, not everybody is in a position to be an entrepreneur. It's not an easy thing. You're trying to create something out of nothing. That's if it was easy, everyone would do it. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Man, there have never been truer words. So, Jake, folks that might be interested in hearing more about you, maybe they want to buy the product. Where can they find you on the social web, and where can they yeah, buy your so product? Yeah, so, Warren, you know, we have our Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. It's all Crete, K-R-E-T-E dot C-L-U-B. Our website is also Crete dot club, not dot com. It's Crete, K-R-E-T-E dot C-L-U-B. Depending on when this airs, our holiday sales like crazy right now. We discounted stuff like I wanted to go big. I wanted to see how many sales we could get because our margins are great. So um, it turns out more than we expected. And I was actually just at a new manufacturing facility this morning because we have to we have to triple our order. So it's nice. But um, yeah, so if this airs soon, you'll have that discount. If not, check out the $6 trial bottle. It's literally a $39 full bottle. We just sell it for 6 bucks with free shipping because we know you're going to buy it. 
we know you're gonna love it. Like it, no, like so many, like such a high percentage of people come back for the second bottle, yep. which is still discounted, like twenty two percent. So that's it. We keep it pretty simple. We have two products now, launching a third one in like March, and then five more other ones coming out next year. I like it. So this might air after the Hollywood. So what I'm going to do the holiday season. So what I'm going to do is I will actually reshare this information though on the Instagram. So folks that are following me, if you are not, please follow me at the shades of E on all the social sites and we'll have create information on there. We'll also have this information on the newsletter. Uh, so if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, you can at the shades of E.com. And then again, we'll have all your uh, website information. So folks that are interested, get a hold. Now, do you have a, are you on social media as well? Yeah, we're on Instagram. We are on Facebook and we just started launching our TikTok stuff. We're not doing any YouTube stuff yet. We don't have really long form content. It's just, you know, we did really well on Facebook, Instagram, and then TikTok's next. Yep. We Our demo was 30 plus. And so now that we're extending into like 25 plus, we're like, okay, we got to get to TikTok a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I am just kind of ventured in the TikTok world. I, I the my biggest audience for my podcast, oddly enough, is LinkedIn. Mm, okay. I mean, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. LinkedIn, LinkedIn marketing for us is not going to be a thing. No, nope, people it makes sense. like professional courses and the, the ads are ludicrously expensive there. So it's like, we're not going to sell, you don't sell consumer products on LinkedIn. We looked into it and it was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter ad platform is so bad. Uh, Snapchat's just a little too young of an audience. Yep. So we look, Pinterest is interesting. When we launch the females in a year or two, we'll, we'll probably try Pinterest. Anyway, I'm just saying that because it's more marketing advice. No, I, I'm, I, I personally enjoy it. I'm probably going to send you my website and you can tell me exactly what I need to do because I'm trying to rebuild that thing myself. I've never done any classes. I'm like you. I'm going to YouTube University, uh, building it through Wix, just trying to get my understanding, people, get in grasp. You know, people like to talk about that, but like, I am very passionate about redoing our education system. And like, I'm not going to say, okay, let me redo all the schools. I'm just going to start with at least my experience. Yep. I've taught myself a lot of things at a professional level, music editing, video editing, chemistry, a lot of the business things I know completely taught myself because it's just about diligence. Oh, I don't know what ROI is. Google it. Oh, it means return on investment. I don't know what ROAS is. Oh, yep. it's return on ad spend. Okay. It's, it's just years of Googling things and making sure I care enough to remember them. And then all of a sudden you're a competent business person and can start companies. Yeah. Okay. All that's free. It's all free. You, it, what's not free is time, attention, and direction. You need to know the direction of things you need to look into. But yep, that's there's true. a lot of audiobooks. An audiobook for 12 bucks or whatever on Audible that could be a, a semester of college right there. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm, I literally earlier Googled and I, don't be ashamed to Google folks. I literally Googled earlier SKU cause we're about to launch a oh, I didn't know product. what that was. I, I didn't know what that was after I launched a company. Yes. Yeah, SKU. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't. And I, it was in a contract and I was like, this is a typo. I, I remember that. <laughs> so I'm in the same boat, man. And now it's like, it's like second nature. Yeah. Because it's so important. Right. It's like yeah. kind of monitored. So yeah, I'm, I'm we're learning and I, I folks uh, that are listening, I really hope this podcast has uh, acts as a learning tool for you as well, because that's, that's the premise of it. The goal is really to highlight these entrepreneur stories and really focus on what they're doing and hopefully, you know, getting some advice, uh, giving some free advice to you as the listeners and, and hopefully some inspiration. Uh, you know, as, as you said, you know, this isn't for the faint of heart, but people can, you can do it. There's people that are willing to help you to do it. Uh, whether you want to go the venture capital route, angel route or self-funding, uh, there's always going to be help along the way. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of resources. One thing I've found, um, is share your ideas because no one's going to steal them. Someone said this to me when I had my software company, I think I was like 24 and we had built this app and I was so worried about telling anyone because I thought they'd steal it. They said, if you walked into Mark Zuckerberg's office right now and pitched it to him, he'd tell you, get out of my office. If you actively tried to have Facebook or Google steal your idea, they wouldn't because they don't have time for your stuff, you know? Yep. So someone said that to me. I said, oh, that's probably right. Okay. The guy, my neighbor who I'm telling or my friend or whatever, they're not going to steal it. What they would have to do is start a company, believe in it so much, they're going to spend two, three, four, five years and money on it. Like, share your idea because only by getting feedback from people will your idea actually become something useful for people. You know, feedback is the best thing. And like, your idea is not that 
that brilliantly different than everyone else's. Obviously, if there's like a patentable part, maybe keep that a little secret. Right. But we're successful because I tell ideas to people and they go, that's really stupid. I go, okay, I won't do that. Yeah. Or that's really great. And I build a small version of it. And then they'd say, okay, that's really good, but I don't like this part. And then whatever. And after a bunch of feedback cycles, all of a sudden you have something that everybody likes. Yep. Very true. Learn, learn to fail fast, right? You don't, yeah. you don't want to be given fool's gold and make sure when you are in- inquiring uh, with individuals, you're not, you're just inquiring with people that are going to give you the answer you want, right? Truly go after the yeah. consumer that you're targeting. It's funny because people use that phrase fail fast and something about it has always just bugged me because it's like learn to fail small and win fast to me. It's like it's not necessarily failing fast. You don't want to fail. You, It's totally fine if you do fail. You're going to fail a lot. But keep the fails small. Keep them small and fast and then also the wins small and fast. And then just keep doing the wins and stop doing the fails. I just thought the fail fast, it's like that leaves out such a big part of the picture. Like, you, you know, because then everyone's just trying stuff and it's not working. It's like, but I'm failing fast. It's like, okay, great. Well, but how about, how about some wins? Our wins are not giant. They're not like, oh my God, we launched this product for a different company. It's like, we have a new landing page. You know, our marketing is six, seven percent more efficient the next week. It's like, wow, that's great. Now new email is another 4% more efficient. We launched a new product. Our average order values went up $6. It's those wins that stack up that take you to like, yeah. 200% return on ad spend to a 400% over a year and a half. And then you're printing money, you know? So, so that's my thing. It's like the wins are not going to be monstrous. Maybe if you clear a check for a million dollars, that's a big win. But like the day to day is small wins. They just, they add up. It's very true. I, I'm not gonna lie. I got a check the other day for 500 and I was ecstatic. I'm like, we're making a revenue. We're not profitable. We're making a revenue. Those are wins. Those are big. Okay. That's a different thing. That's like an emotional win too. I celebrate those because you need those. Um, because at the end of the day for a company like us, it's, this is not going to change my life for another year or two until it's big enough where I'm going to take a salary that's exactly. crazy or maybe exactly. a salary that's crazy. So I need to take the wins or we cross blank revenue a day or this product just launched. We celebrate those wins for sure. It's just like the launching of a product is okay, turn on the website. It's like, it's not this dramatic thing. There's no fireworks going off. It's just like one day we're selling another thing and like, yeah. okay, our website just looks 10% different. Right. It has a shop button on it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, okay. Like nothing <laughs> dramatic happened. It's like, oh, great. So you have to celebrate those things. But yeah, I mean, again, focus, discipline and prioritization. Just figure out what you have to do every day. That's That's the thing that people don't usually get right. They, they spend a lot of time working on things they think sound good, but aren't actually going to deliver value. Very true. Yeah. Jake, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I really do appreciate it. For those folks listening, uh, again, you can subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com or you can follow me on all the social sites at the Shades of E. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.